you remember the story of the buffalo's wife that's a basic legend of the of the blackfoot tribe and um is the origin legend of their buffalo dance rituals which had by been. which they uh, uh invoke the cooperation of the animals in this play of life when you realize the size of some of these tribal groups to feed them required a good deal of uh, of meat and uh, one way of acquiring meat for the winter would be to drive a buffalo herd to stampede it over a rock cliff well this story is of a blackfoot tribe long long ago and they couldn't get the uh, uh buffalo to go over the cliff the buffalo would approach the cliff and then turn aside so it looked as though they weren't going to have any meat for that uh, winter well the daughter of one of the houses getting up early in the morning to draw the water for the family and so forth looks up and there right above the cliff were the buffalo and she said oh if you only come over i'd marry one of you and to her surprise they all began coming over that was surprise number one. Surprise number two was when one of the old buffaloes, the shaman of the herd, uh, comes and says, all right, girly, off we go. Oh, no, she says. Oh, yes, he said. You made your promise. We've kept our side of the bargain. Look at all my relatives here, dead. Off we go. Well, the family gets up in the morning and they look around and where's Minnehaha, you know? With the father, and you know how Indians are, he looked around, he said, she's run off with a buffalo. He could see by the footsteps. So he says, uh, oh, I'm going to get her back. So he puts on his walking mo moccasins, bow and arrow and so forth, and goes out over the plains. He's gone quite a distance when uh, he, th he feels uh, he better sit down and rest. And he comes to a place that's called a buffalo wallow, where the buffalo like to come and roll around, and get the lice off, and roll around in the mud. So he sits down there and is thinking what he should do now when along comes a magpie, not a beautiful flashing bird, and it's one of those clever birds that uh, has shamanic qualities. Magical qualities. Magical. And the man says to him, oh beautiful bird, he said my daughter ran away with a buffalo. Um, uh, have you seen, will you hunt around and see if you can find her out on the plane somewhere? And the Magpie says, well, there's a lovely girl with the buffaloes right now over there, just a, a bit away. Well, they said the man, will you go tell her that her, her daddy's here, her father's here at the buffalo wallow? Magpie flies over, and uh, the girl is there among the buffalo. They're all asleep. I don't know what she's doing, knitting or something of the kind. And the magpie comes over close to her, and he says, your father's over at the wallow waiting for you. Oh, she said, this is terrible. This is dangerous. I mean, he, these buffalo, they'll kill us. You tell him to wait. I'll be over. I'll try to work this out. So her buffalo husband's behind her, and he wakes up and uh, <clears throat> takes off a horn. He says, go to the wallow and get me a drink. So she uh, takes the horn and goes over, and there's her father. He grabs her by the arm. He says, come. She says, no, no, no. This is real dangerous. The whole herd, they'll be right after us. I have to work this thing out. Now, let me just go back. So she gets the water and goes back, and he, fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of an Indian, you know, that sort of thing. And she says, no, nothing of the kind. He says, yes, indeed. So he gives a buffalo bellow, and they all get up, and they all do a slow buffalo dance with their tails raised, and they go over, and they trample that poor man to death so that he disappears entirely. He's just all broken up to pieces and all gone. So the girl's crying. And uh, her buffalo husband says, so you're crying? This is my daddy. He said, yeah, but what about us? There are our children, our wives, our parents, and you crying about your daddy. Well, apparently he was a kind of sympathetic, compassionate buffalo. And he said, uh, well, I'll tell you, if you can bring your daddy back to life again, I'll let you go. So she turns to the magpie and says, uh, see, peck around a little bit and see if you can find a bit of daddy. And the magpie does so, and uh, he comes up finally with a vertebra, just one little bone. And the little girl says, that, that's plenty. 
Now we put this down on the ground, and she puts her blanket over it, and she sings a revivifying song, a magical song with great power. And presently, yes, there's a man under the blanket. She looks daddy all right, but he's not breathing yet. A few more stanzas of whatever the song was, and he stands up, and the buffalo are amazed. And they say, well, why don't you do this for us? We'll teach you now our buffalo dance, and when you will have killed our families, you do this dance and sing this song, and we'll all be back to life again. That's the basic idea, that through the ritual, that dimension is struck which transcends temporality, and out of which life comes, and back into which it goes. And it goes back to this whole idea of death, burial, and resurrection, not only for human beings, but, but for the animals too. So the story of the buffalo's wife was told to confirm the reverence. That's right. What happened when the white man came and slaughtered this animal of reverence? That was a sacramental violation. I mean, they, in the 80s, when the buffalo hunt uh, was undertaken, you know, the 1880s, Kit Carson, years ago. Buffalo Bill yeah. and so forth, uh, when I was a boy, uh, whenever we went for sleigh rides, we had a buffalo robe. Buffalo, buffalo, buffalo robes all over the place. This was the, the, the sacred animal of the Indian. These hunters go out with repeating rifles and, and shoot down the whole herd and leave it there. They take the skin to sell and the body's left to rot. This is a sacrilege. And it, it really is a sacrilege. It turned the, it turned the buffalo from a vow to an it. The Indians addressed the buffalo as, as thou, a thou, an object of reverence. The Indians addressed life as a thou. I mean, trees, and stones, and everything else. You can address anything as a thou, and you can feel the change in your psychology as you do it. The ego that sees a thou is not the same ego that sees an it. Your whole psychology changes when you address things as an it. And when you go to war with the people, the problem of the newspapers is to turn those people into its, so that they're not thou's. So myths are stories of, of the search by men and women through the ages for meaning, for significance, to make life signify, to touch the eternal, to understand the mysterious to find out who we are. People say that what we're all seeking is a meaning for life. I don't think that's what we're really seeking. I think what we're seeking is an experience of being alive. So that uh, the life experiences that we have on the purely uh, physical plane will have resonances within that are those of our own innermost being and reality and uh, so that we actually feel the rapture of being alive. Uh, that's what it's all finally about, and that's what these uh, clues help us to find within ourselves. Myths are clues? Myths are clues to the spiritual potentialities of the human life. What we're capable of knowing within? Yes. And experiencing with it. Yes. I, I liked your definition. You changed the definition of a myth from the search for meaning to the experience of, the experience, of meaning. The experience. The experience of life. The experience of life. The mind has to do with meaning. In here, what's the meaning of a flower? That uh, Zen story of the Sermon of the Buddha when his whole company was gathered and he simply lifted a flower. And there's only one man, Kashyapa, who gave him the sign with his eye. What's the meaning of the universe? What's the meaning of a flea? The, uh, it's just there. That's it. And your own meaning is that you're there. Now we are so engaged in doing things to achieve purposes of outer value uh, that we forget that the inner value, the, the rapture that is associated with being alive is what it's all about.
What's the journey I have to make? You have to make. Each of us has to make. You talk about something called a soul's high adventure. My general formula for my students is follow your bliss. I mean, find where it is and don't be afraid to, to follow it. Can my bliss be my life? Well, love or my it life's will be work? Your is life. it my work or my life? Well, if the work that you're doing is the work that you chose to do because you are enjoying it, that's it. But if you think, oh, gee, I couldn't do that, you know, that's your dragon that's locking you in. Oh, no, I couldn't be a writer. Oh, no, I couldn't do what so-and-so is doing. Unlike the classical heroes, we're not going on our journey to save the world, but to save ourselves. And in doing that, you save the world. I mean, you do. The influence of a vital person it vitalizes. There's no doubt about it. It, it, it. The world is a wasteland. People have the notion of saving the world by shifting it around and changing the rules and so forth. And no, any world is a living world if it's alive. And the thing is to bring it to life. And the way to bring it to life is to find in your own case where your life is and be alive yourself, it seems to me. Do you say I have to take that journey and go down there and slay those dragons? Do I have to go alone? If you have someone who can help you, that's fine too. But uh, ultimately, the, the last trick has to be done by you.